Morning everyone, my name's uh, Oliver Burke uh, and I'm wearing a couple of hats today, one as the chair of Northamptonshire's Local Nature Partnership but perhaps more proudly as trustee of uh, the Neen Rivers Trust. So I'd just like to say a big thank you and well done to Catherine and the team because I know how much effort uh, goes into putting on a day like today and uh, uh, it really has been uh, very professionally run and I know yesterday went really well as well. So. Um, the session I'm introducing today is about the wetland restoration work and the river restoration work that's been going on in and around uh, the Neen, a topic that's really close to uh, my heart. Okay, so um, we're going to hear from got, a number um, of colleagues that I've uh, worked Bruce, with very closely uh, Matt, over the year. Uh, and Victor, who are going to be talking to us about the work that they've been doing in and around the river to start with. So, Victor, I'm handing over to you. Okay, thanks, Ollie. Um, I see I missed a slide already. I'm off the ball. Uh, <laughs> I was put in charge of this and I've... Uh, Done a bit, gone a bit wrong already. But uh, yes, I'm. I was in charge of the Resilient River project. Um, thanks to obviously everyone at the bottom here who who helped support it. Um, a bit of background about it. Um, we sort of the river has been so modified. Um, if you know it by being around it, it's been so modified through time. With you know mainly for navigation and obviously for flood risk, which has a massive impact on the the environment but anyway um the back channels and the backwaters was our main focus because they offer the ability to hold better habitats they're more secluded they're away from the pressures of, of navigation on the river and it gave us the opportunity to actually deliver works meaningful works that weren't um possible on on the main river we sort of looked at the the river corridor and the habitats in it and around it, um, and sort of formed this initial idea in the main bid, which I was part of from the, from the start, about how we can actually make an actual difference and do the work that needs to happen. Um, the project was led by ourselves at the Nen Rivers Trust, with help from the Environment Agency and the Wildlife Trust, and a lot of our funding, it was pretty much 50-50 split. Um, what we were looking at with the, the outcomes from Heritage Lottery, as you can see up there, you might not be able to read all that because it is very small, um, but what, what our outcomes were for the project was the ecology of the river being better managed, um, investing in skills for habitat monitoring um, and volunteers and, and knowledge building, improving the water quality and getting people to understand the importance of the management regimes on the main river itself but also how and why the back channels sort of function and are controlled with the levels that that they are and that was sort of mainly based around the landowners and the farmers that I engage with through the project. During the development stage which seems like a million years ago now um, we commissioned Steve Brayshaw um, and, my, and I worked alongside him and we surveyed 42 of the back channels and backwaters along the Nen Valley. There is a few more, but they'd recently had some sort of work done to them, some improvements, so we didn't think that uh, they needed looking at again. We did desktop surveys and then winter and summer walkovers, which was brilliant in the summer, although there was a lot of nettles to get through in a lot of the more isolated places, and very cold and wet in the winter. But the reason we, you have to do both is to see how they operate all year round. There's no point looking at the low flows when actually you might design something that it can't, it's not going to have an impact in, in the high flows either. Um, and they were all categorised into a big shortlist and put into five categories. That's a little snapshot of the shortlist in a massive Excel document. And there was quite a few, as you can see here, that were there was no action possible to be taken whether that was because of the management of them the feasibility or just we'd have to spend way too much money to make any meaningful impact in on them at all there's quite a few of the backwaters were, were sort of proposed to the EA to do weed cutting when they're all going along in their boats to open them out a few that were retained and, and managed as as sort of more drier backwaters as they were sort of silting up anyway tend to deliver and 10 potential other projects which sort of sit in there. So the first year was was great fun. Um, got stuck straight into to some projects that we sort of had prepped from the development stage. 
the overall budget for all of the project was around five hundred thousand pounds. So we had quite a lot of money to spend, and as you can see, it does it does go quite far. So the first project, oh, a lot of it is just pictures, by the way. So you can just see pretty things, and I'll talk about it. Was at Barnwell in a back channel, which runs alongside the country park there, a nice public location, and a lot of opportunity to do things that people can see and help people understand. So it was one of the sort of the flagship ones in year one. Um, there was a lots of hinging and pinning of trees, which is what this is. Um, you can see that there's posts um, in there with, with shackles to retain the trees. That helps create flow variation and offer cover and refuge for fish and birds. Um, we did those both lower down in the channel and at high level flows as well. So up on the banks to sort of when, when that level was up and it's in serious flood, there is somewhere for the, for the small fish to go and hide. And through the year, terrestrial animals and, and things are using that as habitat. Um, we did some, it's a bit of a poor picture, but this little limb up here was cut off and neatly fitted into a little area of erosion. So some natural bank protection there um, that was done. We put 160 tonnes of gravel in the channel to replenish the gravel stocks. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier is how it's how the the net is so managed for for sort of water levels and navigation and flooding that there's a lot of weirs pretty much everywhere and that starves the channel of the natural gravels coming from upstream. So um, there is a bit of replenishment in the channels, but not enough, not what there should be. So we put in 160 tons to create nice shoals um, for fish spawning for inverts as well, and we put in some brushwood bundle. Um, revetment as well to protect a bit of bank and let it backfill with sediment and, and reclaim a bit of bank. Um, we, Because it was so public, we did some nice things like put in some lovely wood carving benches and statues and an interpretation panel or, or two um, just to help people understand. We did run some riv guided river walks there as well to to let the public have opportunity to, to um, just learn about it and understand what we're doing and why. There was Elton, so this is one of the things that um, you have a lot on the Nen, a really messed up Ford um, that's been absolutely trashed by cattle. Elton Back Channel is probably one of the premier viable fisheries in the country. Um, there's a little exclusive syndicate from the Peter Brangling Club that is on there. It's produced some British record shaking barbel in its time. So having the sediment going in the channel all year round, because the cattle are in there pretty much all year going across it, it just doesn't help with the spawning of, of the barbel. They're very, sh the recruitment form is very low anyway, and this is obviously making it a lot worse. So we put in a nice bit of light crushed granite to, to line it. Um, it is a concrete base in the channel. Put pasture pumps in for the cattle and a new fence line around it to keep, to keep them out and stop them poaching it. Um, and did some tree planting with the local angling club which is one of the things you wanted to do is get the volunteers in, which there wasn't a lot of opportunity for, but tree planting is a great one. We also had white mills, and this is a classic bit of erosion. This project has been on, was predated my time at the Nen Rivers Trust. It had been sort of highlighted and n nothing was ever done. So I thought this is a great opportunity to do some bank regrading and put it right, put a new fence line in. It has created a nice berm already, this isn't that bad, it's just trampled down. Um, but obviously you've got sheer cliff faces and when this floods, it, there's a lot of sediment going in the channel. You can see it a bit higher in higher flows. And we regraded it. This is it sort of, I think about a year on where it's sort of vegetated up. There's a fence line in the background and we did a lot of hinging and pinning there. And there's me and a, um, a Wildlife Trust volunteer doing some of that with help from the Wild Trout Trust. Year two, it was pretty much much of the same. We did a lot of hinging and pinning, gravel introduction and fencing. Both of these are fairly close by. You've got Aylesworth and Nassington, um, both controlled by the, the um, Peter for Angling Club. And there's loads of artsy shots of some bigger sort of trees, bigger limbs being hinged and pinned in the channel. Smaller ones again, loads of Aylesworth and sort of with the fence in it, which is pretty obvious what it is. It was um, quite two nice and easy projects to do. Obviously, COVID sort of hit in the middle of that, sort of towards the end of it. So we had a few issues with, with getting the contracts in to do, do the gravel. 
year three and beyond because of with COVID, it all got extended a little bit because delivery of, of some of these projects was pretty tricky in those times. But these, these three are, well, one of them is meant to be starting very soon. Um, but these three are a bit bigger and a bit more grand than, than the first two years. So I was trying to save the best to last um, to make a bit of a showcase, obviously. The first one is a backwater. Um, this is the only backwater in about three miles of river that offers the refuge for fish in the winter times and for sporting habitat as well. And as you can see, it's very, very weeded up, <laughs> um, very inaccessible. We had the electro fishing survey done in uh, December with the levels up where it should be packed full of fish trying to get out the main channel. And there was two very small fish found <laughs> in there. Um, so completely inaccessible, like I said, the only one in the only sort of habitat in three miles that uh, can offer that refuge and it couldn't be used it couldn't be accessed um so we desilted it all and did some bank protection up there unfortunately obviously this year has been ridiculously hot and ridiculously dry so the water levels have been so low that the reeds have started to establish themselves in little pockets in in the mouth there and in various other places it's just been really unlucky if we'd had a really wet year, it wouldn't have happened. Um, so even though it seems like a bit of a a bit of kick, a bit of a kick in the teeth, and it hasn't worked, it has. It's just a, it's just been unfortunate with the weather. We did one thing here to try and stop the sedimentation building up, which is quite hard to see. But we lowered the the bank at the mouth there to try and create more of a drawing effect when the flows are up. So instead of hitting sort of it coming at a right angle, the water can sort of try and swirl around the bank protection or take a bit of the brunt of it and it should draw some of the sediment out out of the backwater now it's a really really interesting one and one that was um quite close to my heart growing up in wellingborough and fishing at the embankment i don't know if any of you know it obviously being up here but it's very industrial you've got a big mill site lots of concrete lots of bricks lots of sheet piling um as long as I've known it since since being a kid, it has been it, it's looked exactly like this, and nothing's ever been done. And I managed to stumble across a quite a new sort of innovative sort of uh, technique to green up, do some soft engineering there, which are floating ecosystems. Um, there's a company called Biomatrix who are up at the right at the north of Scotland that create these floating ecosystems. They sit on cages and they go up and down on the flows, which when you're doing river work, the fact that it goes up and down on the water level means you get rid of all the nasty flood modeling type stuff you have to do because it, it doesn't impact it at all. Um, this is then being put in. There was 252 square meters of habitat created just on the surface with plants. They were planted with some trees. There is some little trees in there, but all native aquatic species, purple loose drive, yellow flag iris, and quite a few sedges. So all year round, they're green. Whether that's this time of year, in the depths of February, there's always some greenery there. Um, this is the first part of them being installed across a sheet piling. There was sections that weren't sort of done, mainly because it was just a bit too difficult to anchor and you couldn't have them everywhere. Cost was another thing. They are quite expensive. Um, I didn't want to use all of the budget do <laughs> on one project uh, for this year. But as you can see, this is them probably about four months after being installed. They're installed in the end of March of 2021. And this is in June, I think. So you can see there's some lovely, nice colour coming on. from they've, They establish very quickly and they're starting to hide that, that nasty sheet piling um, that people look at when they're on the, the public side. There's one right in front of the old mill, which is pretty much derelict, but it would be very nice to do something with that in the future. And there is some video footage. So not only do they create the habitat above the water for birds and things, and mainly it is quite aesthetic uh, as well, but um, these, are, these are the root systems in the summer that have come down through the coir rolls and are creating so much habitat for inverts, fish fry, and pretty much everything else, obviously having the fish congregate around it and, and it offers opportunity for the predators to, to get in there and, and sort of go after them as well. So there's 252 square meters on top of the water. There's also 252 sort of 
square meters underneath as well, um, creating habitat. And this is, again, established a couple of little a bit of footage from a, lo a guy from a local YouTube channel that's, that's done, he's called Purple Vision. If you do want to learn more about Wellenborough, he does so many interesting videos about the heritage um, of Wellenborough. But as you can see on the left-hand side, concrete, moorings, nothing really great. On the on the right hand side now we've got these floating ecosystems in the difference that is made there, so an amazing little project. I think everyone that all the members of the public down there have have sort of enjoyed it and been really really sort of positive responses to it. And I said it's something very close to my heart because it's something that you know I grew up with not not having that nice sort of stuff. My kids, my friends, and family were all down there, and loads of people I know have seen it and. It's quite nice to know that I had an impact to people that I sort of I know and that and for future generations. Again, one of a few of the sort of more public projects that we've done. There is the electric cut, as I mentioned, which is getting ready to, to go. A very historic sort of backwater now of, of Peterborough. It was the old electric power station outflow. So it was warm water all year round. People used to swim in it all year round. It used to be one of the best fisheries in the country all year round um, because even in the depths of minus conditions in, in December, you could catch an absolute bag full of fish in there. They used to bust people in from all over the country for matches. Um, since the power station has gone, it's been cut off. It's a backwater. It's just There's no flow and it's silted up and become horrendously weedy. Um, and if you look up it, the weeds taken over, the reeds have taken over, and it's inaccessible to fish. Again, we did an electrofishing survey, there was barely anything in it. So something that we're going to deseal, open up, and create a much better habitat for the fish in the local area, and it might even start fishing well. The Angling Club do have the fishing rights here, but I don't think it's been fished for decades. But um, as you can see, quite a few pictures of how bad it's got. Hopefully, that it won't look like that anymore <laughs> in the future once the project's finished. So did we succeed in what we wanted to do? I'm not going to read them all out. I'll give you a second to read them. But there's over five kilometres of river improved, I think about £57 pounds per metre for the restoration. Um, 300 banks, 300 metres of bank regraded, quite a few trees, a lot of landowners engaged, of you know that we had some student interns and volunteers to to help along the way as well. I think most importantly, what have we learned? What did we learn from this project? Well, having everyone within the EA involved was great. It made my work in a lot easier. There was a lot less ob obstacles to get through. We did have issues getting volunteers um, because most of these sites it wasn't volunteer friendly, unfortunately. Uh, to do a lot of this work but it's something that maybe we should have anticipated beforehand but didn't and as a result we we probably didn't get as much volunteer hours as as we would have wanted the most important thing is how lucky we've been i think not just for this project but overall for nenescape we've managed to achieve so much as a landscape partnership that i think if we got this money now and we were starting now we wouldn't be able to do, have done the half of it. I know certainly for my project with increasing costs, a lot of that work we would, wouldn't have been able, wouldn't have been possible because of the costs um, involved. Our legacy is hopefully all these projects will last and, and they'll, they'll be in situ and everything will stay and it will keep improving the river long after the projects have, um, have sort of tailed off. I'm currently working on another project at the, on the other Barnard Back channel, there's always a shortlist to, to f try and uh, work stuff into when funding becomes available. We're never going to stop looking for the opportunities. And also, there's a River Eyes partnership, which is growing, um, which is something I'm now getting involved with. There's a really nice project happened on the Slade Brook um, to open up a big floodplain. And hopefully, there's plenty of opportunities there. I'll shut up now and let someone else speak. I'll just say thanks to everyone on the list. And it's a lovely picture of an otter using some of the, uh, if you can't see it, it's just there. <laughs> yeah. um, there. There is another one underwater at that time. That was whilst the contractors were about 20 meters downstream after they've just, just dragged out a tree. So 
everything is used in this stuff. It's not just for fish. And yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Victor. Um, so moving on to Farming the Future, which was a wildlife trust led project within the securing the future theme of Nenscape or Nenscape. So while Victor was improving the riverine environments, we were trying to improve the land around the Nen Valley for wildlife and going forwards. Um, the background behind this was, as John said, we've had 10,000 years of the Nen Valley being shaped. A lot of that has been done by farming, but that farming has really rapidly changed in the last sort of 50 years and wildlife has struggled to keep up with the changes. We've lost some sort of wildflowers, meadows seem to have lost about 97% of those. Some of our meadows and wetlands have decreased as well and they're really important for supporting a whole host of things, insects, holding flood water, wildlife, recreational benefits. And also we've lost some of the culture of sort of hay time being a sort of a whole village community event. So in terms of developing this project, we went out and we thought, who, who better to help us develop it than the farmers that we're going to be working alongside? So we arranged a couple of evenings in um, local pubs to get their input in what we should put into the project. Unfortunately, we chose the same day that the Environment Agency announced some lock reversal schemes that were quite controversial with the farming community. So we basically had 20 angry farmers questioning us about something we knew very little about and had no control over. But once we'd got over that and we'd brought them all a pie and a pint, they then kind of settled down and actually gave us some really good feedback. And we came up with some aims and objectives um, for Farming the Future to deliver it on. So basically, we wanted to restore meadows and wetlands. Farmers were keen, but they needed funding, so we ran a grant scheme. They wanted advice and help getting into countryside stewardship and other schemes, so we employed a land advisor. Um, we did wanted to do two flagship restoration schemes in country parks where the public could come and see what could be going on in the wider farmed environment. We wanted to improve access interpretation in some of the really good sites that we had already, train up landowners in wider environmental management and just increase public awareness of what great habitats and wildlife importance we have in the Nen Valley. Uh, so to do that, we wanted to build on the success of the nature improvement area that we'd previously done, had a land advisor, built up some contacts with farmers, but really learned that you need a long-term project if you're going to sort of develop trust, work up schemes, deliver schemes. So we wanted a full-time land advisor, so we're able to positively work with the Environment Agency and DEFRA as well to bring in some match funding, which gave us five years of a full-time land advisor, plus funding to run this grant scheme to fund farmers to do the work, and also work in partnership. So we set up a working group with other land advisors in the county, Natural England, Catchment Centre Farming, Environment Agencies, etc. Basically, what we wanted to do was turn more of these flooded arable fields into these lovely wildflower meadows. So I was very much involved in the development part of it, and then we employed land advisors. Bruce, who has been leading on the project the last couple of years, is going to take you through what we actually achieved on the ground. All right, so our grant scheme had uh, this set of options uh, broadly categorised as uh, habitat, uh, restoration, creation, uh, options, meadow creation, wetland restoration, pond management, uh, wildflower rich margins, which uh, was a specific ar uh, arable target option. Hard measures, so you've got the fencing for your waterways, gateway resurfacing, um, ditches in wetlands, uh, leaky woody dams, and then our public engagement options. So interpretation for the sites that we've um, created, restored, uh, helped manage, and public access improvements for rights of way along um, agricultural areas. Um, the target areas, so uh, riparian access uh, areas accessed by livestock. Um, access to water is a, a key part for uh, livestock production and lots of farmers uh, up and down the river. Um, I'll avoid saying Nen or Nen, I'm just going to say river because I don't want to get shouted at. Uh, <laughs> uh, farmers freely let cattle drink from the, from the edge of the brooks and the rivers, um, which erodes the bank sides leading to siltation um, of the watercourse sediments uh, from... Uh, <coughs> that they're walking into the rivers and the dung and urine that uh, is added to the watercourses by the cattle, um, polluting the watercourses. Um, previously high nature value areas that have become degraded. Uh, there are a number of known sites uh, along the river that have become degraded through uh, land use and management change over the years, like Matt alluded to, the number of uh, floodplain meadows uh, has dropped across the country and dramatically in Northamptonshire. Um, floodplain meadow areas that were low botanical value. Um, we've 
<coughs> through uh, intensified grassland uh, and floodplain meadow management with uh, low, low botanical diversity due to increased agricultural uh, inputs, either um, additions of fertilizers, reseeding or um, sediment inputs that come naturally from flood events. Uh, areas that sit wet during spring and uh, are not suitable for agricultural machinery due to the changing nature of agriculture. The breeds of cattle and sheep have got bigger, they're a lot heavier. The machinery has got bigger and heavier. Um, and lots of areas that used to be pretty farmable with a uh, lightweight machinery can't, um, aren't anymore and are more likely to be damaged by uh, heavier machinery. Marginal areas that have high nature potential. There's uh, marginal, area, marginal areas which have been left and need specialist management advice um, provided by us to improve these for wildlife. Um, areas close to existing high nature value sites. Uh, there's a great number of existing uh, areas of uh, high value for that are high value for nature. Um, so we wanted to uh, look at sites surrounding these to increase the uh, overall area of these nice areas of habitats um, and managing improve their management for nature. <coughs> the outputs through uh, reduced water pollution uh, leading to increase in water quality. I think that's one of our really nice outputs that we've had um, through a range of uh, monitoring, mainly through surveys of aquatic invertebrates. We've been able to show how the work and that we've done with farmers and through the grant scheme uh, has been able to uh, improve water quality of a number of brooks that we've done the work on, uh, as well as uh, reducing pollution activities at a number of sites along the river. Uh, meadows have been restored uh, and diversified botanically through our meadow seeding grant options uh, and advice given on grazing management to farmers uh, and, and their graziers. Um, <coughs> riverside meadows uh, have been improved uh, botanically. Um, there is uh, now a far greater area of meadows along the Neen Valley that are botanically richer and diverse as a direct result of the work that we've been able to do. Uh, wetland habitat network has been expanded along the length of the River Neen. Um, some of you well, hopefully have seen uh, our appearances on uh, Countryfile, the news and a couple of other places uh, regarding the, the rotary ditching work that we've done up and down the county all the way from um, west of Northampton, uh, all the way following along the river up to uh, the Nen washes. Um, this work has greatly increased the uh, the area of um, wetland uh, within the valley and has um, added great value to the corridor, to the um <coughs> wetland habitat corridor uh, that is the uh, Neen Valley. Uh, agricultural habitat management advice provided by farmers and specialist habitat management advice has been disseminated to farmers. We've been able to advise farmers and land management and land managers on how they can add value to their farms with specialist habitat management advice and disseminating uh, information about wildlife schemes that will pay farmers to uh, manage their uh, land for wildlife. There's been a wide range of public engagement and we've been able to increase uh, public knowledge of the importance of these habitats along the Neen Valley. Ah, said it. Um, <laughs> through a range of online and in-person uh, meadow ecology and species ID courses, we've been able to spread the word about the importance of the floodplain meadow sites, the wetland sites, um, and a multitude of other habitats um, within Northamptonshire. Um, uh, across the wider population living in Northamptonshire and also a uh, much wider area through the online courses that we uh, ran during COVID. And here is a rather nice map of all the um, the sites that we've been able to do. And so all of the, the purple sites are our uh, rotary ditching sites. So we've you see a lovely, uh, nice lot of uh, nice corridor up and down uh, uh, within the Neen Valley. And then all the other sites are our uh, meadow creation sites, a nice lot of pond restoration here. Um, I think these are all meadow uh, restoration reseeding sites. I believe these are also meadow restoration sites. And then there's a uh, multitude of fencing, the fencing work that I mentioned previously to keep cattle out of the river. Um, uh, the legacy of the project, as Matt said, we've now got a, a land advisor position, which is full time at the Wildlife Trust, um, uh, based in Northamptonshire. Uh, this position will continue to 
engage with farmers uh, in the Neen Valley and across uh, the wider county, engaging them and advising them on wildlife friendly management systems they, that they can uh, combine with their farming system to improve wildlife uh, on their farm, uh, create new habitats and diversify. Uh, our project steering group, uh, our project steering group, is le uh, which has been um, led by Wildlife Trust, made up of Wildlife Trust staff, Natural England, farm advisors, EA flood management, um, and uh, other EA operational staff, Freshwater Habitats Trust, Anglin Water, and other uh, local project uh, advisors. Um, this is going to continue past um, the project uh, into the future, meeting three or four times a year. A year. This has been really crucial um, for quite a few of our projects, being able to discuss um, what we're all doing. We're all trying to do the same thing, and with so many different budget pots, it's, it makes sense to um, group all of our knowledge together and our expertise and work together on a lot of projects. And some of these that we've worked together have been really successful. I say they've all been really successful. <laughs> um, uh, more farmers now know that we, the Wildlife Trust, exist are offering farmland uh, specific management advice to help them improve wildlife on farms. Um, the farmers themselves have been now knowing that we're offering this advice, are really open to engaging with us um, and doing environmental work on their farm, which is really positive. Um, our target area uh, has been <coughs> land managed uh, sorry, land managed in a more naturally nature-friendly manner. Our target areas, which, uh, this map here, which was our entire target area, that is, sorry, Northampton here, Peterborough up here, and I think Alan Faps and everything else. So, yeah, Northamptonshire. Um, uh, our target area uh, is better managed uh, for wildlife with a greater value and is of greater value for wildlife uh, and the wider environment than uh, it was previous to our work taking place. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I know we're running over time and I'm being sort of given glaring stares from the back of the room, but I'd just quickly like to uh, ask Andy with his uh, Environment Agency hat on. How's the Resilient Rivers project perhaps differed from some of the other work that you've been involved in? Well, it's, um, we in the Environment Agency certainly have been sort of following the Resilient Rivers model now. So um, over, the, over many years now, we've been shifting more from doing individual projects um, to moving to more sort of catchment scale working with effective partnerships and, uh, and delivering projects with multi-benefits as well. So it's been, uh, it's been really useful, um, really valuable working with Nam Rivers Trust and the other partners uh, to, to kind of get these sustainable and environmental improvements through this kind of this way of working on, on, on projects. So we've, um, we've been doing a number of other projects, and Vic alluded to it a little bit earlier, um, the Wicksteed project, which is on the, the Eyes and Slade Brook around Kettering. Um, so that's where the, the Eyes is the largest tributary of the, of the River Nen. So um, we've been doing works there, which are looking to reconnect the river through a realignment to the floodplain. And that'll bring a whole load of different benefits, such as um, using ecosystem services to, to, to sort of polish the water up to improve water quality. Um, reduce flood risk by getting the water out on the floodplains, which is, is so isolated now. So uh, because of uh, dredging and maintenance practices in the past, uh, and and improving biodiversity through through that creation of much more complex habitats. So it's uh, it's, it's it's really valuable to try and do that kind of work, and we, we we're expanding this now because. As I mentioned, is catchment scale is really important. So there's no point doing these things in isolation. They have their value, but if you can do it look at catchment scale, then, then you get much more benefit. And we've got another project uh, just north of Kettering on, uh, on the Bowton Estate, which again is reconnecting the floodplain using old historic features, um, as well as improving fish passage through historic weirs and structures there that are on the, on the, on the stately home estate. Um, and, and we've also got funding to do some prioritisation work throughout the Slade catchment to, to look for opportunities to reconnect the floodplain, to bring all those benefits I kind of referred to as well. Uh, and then individually 
Again, these things may only bring small benefit, but collectively they bring a lot of benefit. So I'm kind of really looking forward to working with this lad here, who I've been with uh, on the Wixty project, and, uh, and, and, and Bruce as well, uh, so on, on future projects. So it's looking really bright. Brilliant, brilliant. Sounds really exciting. And uh, uh, having been involved myself in some of that work, it's uh, really fantastic to see uh, uh, you know, the results of it um, coming to fruition. Just quickly, Chris, because we brought you up the front and I don't want you to miss out. Um, it'd be really nice just to briefly understand some of the access challenges that we had um, with the Bringing Nature Closer project at Heron Meadow. Yeah, uh, Ferry Meadows project, literally just over the road, we, we worked on two floodplain meadows, uh, about 30 hectares in total. Um, the main project site was Heron Meadow, which is 21 hectares, and we installed three and a half kilometres of foot drain using the RSPB rotary machine, which was a fantastic machine to see our operation. There is only one in the country, and it was, it was nice to have it actually working on our site. Created, as I say, three kilometres, over three kilometres of very shallow foot drains. Uh, Heron Meadow is part of the floodplain meadow network. It floods very, very readily, and we were managed, we'd be able to get water onto the site and by w removing some of the trees, which was a little bit controversial, um, but they were mainly hybrid poplars with very little ecological value, we took those, removed those from the site and it's actually brought back uh, significant numbers of wildfowl back onto the site, particularly in winter, which was always what we wanted to do um, as target-wise, is to bring wintering birds back onto the site. So we've had counts of over 40 tonight. We're really lucky having Peter Bird Club um, members actually carry taking part in webs counts, wetland bird survey counts on site. So that's providing the data that we need. Um, They've had recorded over 200 widgeon feeding on the field, whereas before the work, nothing would have been on the field. So, you know, it's been quite significant change to the site. Plus, the access to, for, for the general public. public um, we've, it reinstated the riverside footpath, which is a, a fantastic dog walk now for a lot of people. Unfortunately, the fencing prevents the dogs from running onto the site, causing disturbance. So that's a good thing. We've managed to put in two... Uh, observation platform slightly raised above the floodplain meadow and it's a, a site that's not just used by bird watchers it's it's a generally used by a lot of members of the people walk the public walking around ferry meadows as just a, a natural stopping point where you get a lovely view of floodplain meadows in action fantastic thanks chris uh can i just say a big thank you to uh, our speakers um and i'm going to hand over to uh, sean who's going to make up for my bad timekeeping so sorry about that sean <laughs>